All right, the title of my sermon this morning is How to Explain the Plan of Salvation. How to Explain the Plan of Salvation. So I know for those of you who are seasoned soul winners, this may be a bit of a basic sermon, but a lot of people don't really get to go soul winning with me. So I want to go through just each of the points and talk about what I try and communicate at each point, and hopefully that'll help you to better explain the plan of salvation. Um, that's why we're reading through 1 Corinthians 15. That's the famous passage where the gospel is mentioned at the beginning, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, one of the purposes of our church is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and not only in here, but out there as well. And that means every single one of you need to be able to explain the plan of salvation to an unbeliever. So because we don't only preach the gospel in here, it's not only me preaching the gospel, we need to go out into the world, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So every single one of you, you need to take it upon yourself and think, man, I need to be able to explain this. I can't just, you can't always just depend on somebody else to explain it for you because you'll find yourself in situations where only you have that opportunity to give the gospel. And the question is, are you ready? So let's not wait for the opportunities necessarily to come to us. Let's go out into the neighborhood, right, and create those opportunities to talk to people. Because when was the last time, ask yourself this question, when was the last time you told someone about Jesus? You explained how to be saved from hell. One week, two weeks, months, years, never. Maybe. I mean, shame on you. I mean, have you forgotten why we are even here? I mean, have you forgotten the purpose of your life? The purpose of your life is not to chase riches, not to be comfortable, not to just like, you know, get the things that you want for your life. The reason why you are still here, because God has saved you, is to go out and preach the gospel, be fruitful and multiply spiritually. Don't forget the reason why you are on this earth. Don't be so short-sighted that you only think about the temporal things and you don't think about the things of eternity, the things you can't see, right? Which are the souls of men that we need to bring into everlasting life. So have you been too busy being choked about the thorns of this world, the cares, the riches, the pleasures of this life? Now we're not Calvinists here. God isn't just like pulling all the strings and doesn't matter what you do, people are going to get saved or they're not going to get saved. No, your involvement in the Great Commission, your ability to preach the gospel clearly to another human being, it makes a difference. Right? Your ability to strike up a conversation and explain certain concepts, your level of knowledge is going, it, it can change that person's destination. Whether they go to heaven or hell, you may be that person that can convince them, that can change their mind, that can persuade them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, even if you don't get to them, are you responsible for them going to hell? No, because they're going to be responsible for their own sins. They're accountable to God. They'll have ample opportunity. But you know what? You can make a difference. You can, if you, the, the things that you say, the things you bring up, the way you can explain it, the fact that you came across them and, and took that opportunity... It can make a difference. And that's why this is a war that we are in, guys. But unfortunately, the majority of God's people are asleep at the wheel. Right? We're in this war, we're in this spiritual war that's going on that you can't see. And a lot of us, the soldiers that God needs in this army, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And this is why the Bible says... I didn't put it in my sermon, but in Ephesians it says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So, I don't get to go soul winning with everyone here, um, and especially with most of the women, right? So today, I want to go through, like I said, I want to go through just each of the five points that I use to explain the gospel. And I want to just give you my thoughts that when I go through that point, what am I trying to communicate? What is my thought process? What do I want to make sure I nail down as I move through each point? And hopefully um, this helps you guys. So it's going to be based off 
If you haven't read through this already, this is our gospel tract. Right? This is what we give out. And this is modelled off exactly how I give the gospel, right? Because I wrote this. So there's five points in here, right? It's each of the colours. One, two, three, four, five. And I like to sum it up in these five points. And I'll go through it today. Um, but if you don't have a copy of this, grab it, read through it, because that's probably the best start. The best start is you read through that, you memorise the verses that are in there, and that's the best way to start explaining the gospel. You start with a script, you start with, hey, what do you want to explain? And then as you get better, you'll learn more to be able to converse and go back and forth with people. So usually when I start out with somebody, when I'm talking with somebody, and today I'm not really covering how to start a conversation, how to end the conversation. I'm just going to go through just the actual explanation of the plan of salvation. Now usually when I start out, it usually starts at 1 John 5.13. Why? Because oftentimes when you ask people, hey, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? A lot of people don't think you can know. So I like starting at this first sometimes, especially for people with a Christian background or people that already know somewhat about heaven and hell. They think oh, you, don't, you can't know that you're going to heaven. And why do they think that? Nine 99 times out of 100, they think that because they think it takes works. Right? Because they don't know whether they've done enough works. So therefore, hey, well, I hope I'm going to heaven. What they usually mean by that is I hope I'm good enough to make the cut. And what they don't know is that's not what it takes. But if you show them this, you can show them that they've been taught their whole life that you can't know for sure that you're going to heaven, whereas the Bible says very clearly that you can know. 1 John 5.13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So the important points to point out in this verse is that one, you can know you have eternal life. You're not just hoping that one day you might get it. You can know, and you can know that you have, present tense, now you have eternal life. All right? So a lot of people don't know that this passage exists in the Bible, especially a lot of Orthodox and Catholics are told, they are taught that you cannot know. And the, 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 uh, the frustrating thing is a lot of these denominations that are trying to push a works-based assurance or works-based salvation, they, want, they don't want people to know that they're going to heaven. They actually will tell us, hey, it is dangerous if you tell people that they can know that they're going to heaven. And why do they say that? Because they want people to work their way to heaven. They think, hey, well, if I tell them they're going to hell, unless they work, then that will get the change in behavior that we want. Look, that's not the reason why we want people to change their behavior. We want people to change because they love the Lord Jesus Christ. They appreciate what has been done for them. Right? We, we don't want them to work their way to heaven because we're, we, we want them to change. We want them to change their life. So a lot of people are told that you can't know. The Bible is very clear that you can. So sometimes it starts here. And you know, when I explain the gospel to somebody, and I'll just give you some random tips as I'm going through this sermon, you know, I, I, I tend to mention to them, hey, I've got five things to explain to you. All right, so this is something I, I did recently, and when I mean recently, it's like the last couple of years, is when I start explaining to them, rather than just go, hey, verse 1, verse 2, you know, and go through the points, I would say to them up front, you know, hey, there's five things I want to explain to you. And for those of you who have gone soul winning with me, you've seen these things happen a multitude of times. There's five things I want to explain to you. And why do I do that? Because subliminally, it tells them how long you're going to take. Oh, okay, you're going to point one, point two, three. They, but when you just start, they're, just think, they're thinking like, oh, man, how long is this person going to talk for? And sometimes, right? But if you tell them, hey, I've got five things to explain, you go through them, it already gives them in their mind subliminally, hey, this outline that you're going through. Right? And as you go through them sort of quickly, they don't realize that your last two points are like the meatiest, right? So what's the first point in this, uh, in this, in this gospel track? We have all sinned by breaking God's laws. So the first verse I'll go to is Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And now the, the goal of this first point is I want them to admit that they have sinned. That's the first point. So it's not just I want, I don't just want them to understand that they're a sinner. I want them to admit it and say, hey, you know, we've all sinned. You, you can admit that, right? And they'll say, yeah, yeah, we, we've sinned. You know, I've sinned. Um, you might say, you know, I've told a lie before. You ever told a lie before? You know, and then they'll say, yeah, yeah, they have. So if they've acknowledged that they've sinned against God. And now from here, I will tell them, hey, this is why you can't work your way to heaven. 
See, so, so if people think, if they, they first answer you and say, hey, look, well, I think I'm good enough, or you have to be a good person. This is where I'll mention, hey, remember you said, I always tie back in the things they say to me. Right? So when they say to me, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm not that bad a person, or, you know, I think I'm pretty good, or, you know, I just got to be a good person, I'll say, you know, you, you thought you had to be good enough to go to heaven. But see, this verse is saying, hey, we've all sinned. This is why, no matter how good you try and be, you'll never be good enough because you come short. You have to be perfect in order to get to heaven. Now, if I'm struggling a lot to get the point across that, you know, because people say, oh, yeah, you know what, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a rapist, I'm not a murderer, I'm not that bad, but, you know, it's, it's you know, th those people don't deserve it, but, you know, if you, if you can, if you don't do those things, you should be all right. So that's when I might go to Revelation 21, 27. There shall in no wise enter into it. So this is talking about heaven. Anything that defileth, neither worketh abomination, or maketh, how many lies? A lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is why it's very clear that perfection is required in order to get to heaven by your good works. Otherwise, it's they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's your other option. You either get there on your own by good works or you make sure your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So I might ask them, you know, would you admit you know, that you've sinned against God? You know, you admit that you're a sinner? Um, I might ask them, see, one thing is you don't want to assume as well always that sometimes when you're talking with somebody that they understand what sin is. I mean, most people do, but I might just ask them, hey, do you understand what sin is? I want them to understand what sin is. I want them to admit that they have sin. Now, if a person doesn't admit they're a sinner, like you come across people where they just think, oh, yeah, it happens. And people say, oh, you know, I don't sin, or I don't sin anymore, things like that. That conversation already is going to be very difficult, if it's even gotten to that point. Right? So people that don't believe they have sinned, I mean, even if you try to continue, it's going to be very difficult because that person is already very full of pride, right? They can't even admit that they have done wrong in their life against God. And look at James 4, verse 6, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So this is why it's, it's going to be very hard for somebody if they don't admit that they're a sinner. Now, an illustration I might give, like if I'm talking about, hey, we've all sinned and we've come short of the glory of God, this is why we can't be good enough to get ourselves to heaven. An illustration I might give is I'll say, hey, look, you can't undo bad with good. Because right? a lot of people think that that's possible. They think, well, if I do enough good, that'll undo my bad. So I'll give an illustration. Like, let's say a doctor who's like saving lives all the time, and then he commits murder. Now, if that judge said, hey, well, you've saved 100 lives, and you've only taken one life, I mean, would that be just of the judge to say, oh, therefore, we're not going to punish you for murder because look at all the lives you've saved. Of course, there's still going to be a punishment for that crime, right? Especially if he's blatantly committed that crime. So you see how doing good does not get you off the punishment for doing bad, right? So it's the same with God. If, if our humanly court system is that just, surely God is more righteous than that. So that's an illustration I'll use. And I always tie things back, you know, to, to what they say when I, when I explain things. So it's, it definitely helps. It engages them as well. And, you know, when you ask them questions, you know, you want, you want when you explain the gospel to somebody, you want it to be a conversation. So you want to ask questions. When you ask a question, let them respond. That's something very difficult for, for new soul winners, right? New people that are a bit nervous, you know, having given the gospel many times, you're explaining to somebody, and what happens is you just end up like vomiting on people, yeah. right? It's just like, Wah. it's like, just give it. You, know, you got so much to talk about, and you just talk, 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 and you know what? You don't even pause to like give them a breath, give yourself a breath, and this happens to everybody that's new, right? Not just not just people, not just anyone in particular. I'm not talking about anyone in particular. This happens. It happened to me, as well. And you know what? You know why I think it is? I don't know what it is for you guys, but for me, I think what happens is you, you're, you're scared of rejection. You're scared that they're going to bring up something or they're going to say something to cut you off. So you don't give them an opportunity to do that. So people, they just keep talking, talking, talking. But 
you got to have a conversation because you want them to be engaged. Because you know what? If you just talk, 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 you don't ask them any questions. Don't, when you ask them, hey, do you know what sin is? You wait for the response. Yeah. You know, you got to be silent. You know? They say, you know what sin is? Oh, yeah, well, sin is you just keep going. You, answer, you ask them the question and you answer it for them. You know? And you know what happens? They, they, they tune out, right? Because they're not participating in this conversation. I mean, it'd be the same for you, right? Somebody's just talking to you. And you're not really participating in the conversation. You just eventually like zone out. You start like you know hearing music in your head. You go away. So it, it re-engages them as you ask them questions, right? Now the second point. So that's the first point. I want to admit that they're a sinner. So I want them to admit it. That's sort of what my goal is in that first point. And make sure they understand. Look, you cannot work your way to heaven, right? That's the first point. Second point. God is holy and must punish. Sin. So this is where we are going to talk about now the, the punishment of sin, which is hell. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So mainly on this one, I only focus on this first bit of the verse. For the wages of sin is death. So I might ask them, hey, make sure they understand what a wage is. You know, hey, you do something, you, you work for something, you get it in return. Wages of sin is death. So I want to show here that there is a consequence for our sin. Now, one thing that I think is important to point out here is I want to distinguish between a physical death and a spiritual death. Because sometimes when we're talking about life and death and people are thinking, that you don't want them to start thinking, it's crazy, you know, obviously everyone's going to die. You know, we're not going to live physically forever. And they're right, because one day our physical body will die. So I sort of just mentioned that at this point as well. Like, hey... I'm not talking about a physical death. Obviously, everyone physically dies. And the way I explain it, I say, well, when you physically die is when your soul and spirit separate from your body and your body's lifeless on the ground. So when we're talking about death, here we are talking about where does your soul end up? Does your soul end up in heaven or does it end up in hell? So this is why we're talking about the wages of sin is death. Obviously, everyone dies physically but we're talking about where does the soul end up now revelation 21 8 is the next passage i go to to show that the death is talking about the lake of fire now i used to read all these out but recently i just say look it lists up a bunch of sins right because i used to read them out and i feel like sometimes it's a little bit redundant because they don't always know what they all mean and i'm not going to spend time talking about them but the one thing I do point out is all liars, right? Because we go back to that question, hey, you know, you've told a lie, I've told a lie. Yes, you know, this includes us, right? So, you know, we've, there's a whole bunch of sins here. I might mention a few of them. So, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So what I'm tying here together, I'm tying Romans 6, where the wages of sin is death, and I'm showing it here that it's not just the physical death, because it's having your part in the lake of fire. And I might ask them, hey, what's another name? For the lake of fire and then they can say hey well that's also known as hell right so this is where it's being described as a lake of fire so again i want to distinguish between the physical death and the spiritual death so that we're not talking about avoiding a physical death we're talking about avoiding a spiritual death. we can't avoid that 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 physical death right and also sometimes i want to emphasize as well if, and this is when I'm like not talking to maybe somebody with a Christian background. I want to emphasize that hell is eternal, that there's no second chance. Because right? sometimes people have this concept that, well, if I go to hell, that's okay, like I'll, I'll, I'll burn it off, I'll work it off, and eventually I'll get out. So we want to make it very clear, because Muslims have that idea with hell, that it's sort of like a, a chastisement for the believer. You know, obviously uh, Catholics and Orthodox have this idea of uh, purgatory, which is not in the Bible. So some people get this idea, well, if they go, there might be a second chance. So they, you know, they don't have to do something about it now. So I want to make it very clear that once you go to hell, that's it. There is no second chance. That's why you have to do something about it now. So Revelation 20.10, I might use this verse to talk about hell being forever and ever. The devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. So remember, they may say, oh, well, the devil's there forever, but the beast and the false prophet are men. Right? And they're still here a thousand years later and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So I want to make it very clear that there are no second chances once you go to hell. And to help people understand this, 
Because, you know, a thought that goes through people's minds is they'll say, oh, you talk, you're saying hell is, you know, forever and ever just for like one lie? You know, that's the thought that goes through people's minds. Like, that seems a little harsh. That's what they think about. So I'll just preempt that. I'll say that, hey, you know, we think that's pretty harsh. But, you know, it's important that this is showing us what God thinks about hell. So I'm trying to, like, change their perspective. See, we think, ah, oh, you know, sin, what's the big deal? This is really harsh. We have to understand. But the fact that God is just and he's punishing even one lie with hell, this shows how much God hates sin and how grievous our sin is. So when I mention that, that just sort of shifts, helps to shift their perspective. So it addresses that question. All right, so that's number two. God is holy and must punish sin. So what I'm mainly trying to explain here is that there is a consequence. It's hell, but there are no second chances, right? And this is why they have to um, do something about it now. Now, number three. Now, you wonder why I've chosen these different colors. I just tried to choose different colors to represent different things. But, you know, I had black, obviously, sin. Orange is the fire of hell. Jesus Christ took the punishment for our sin. I chose red because, obviously, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so this can help you remember the, the different points as well when you're going through the pamphlet. You know what the main, ish, main point is in each of these pages. So you see, I've just made it line up. Black, orange, red, and blue and green. Now the third point is where we'll explain the gospel. This is where we started in this sermon, 1 Corinthians 15, for I delivered unto you First of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So I started going to this passage because this is the clearest passage that actually explains what Jesus did, and it summarizes it very quickly in two verses. So sometimes I'll mention to people, look, you know, I know you know this, but this is exactly where the Bible says it in, in a very succinct way. Now, depending on the knowledge of the person, you may need to spend more time here. You know, if you're talking to somebody with a Christian background, you may not need to spend a lot of time. So same with point one, two as well. If the person already knows this information, I don't have to spend a lot of time there. Right? So I want to move on. I'm not just trying to say everything I want to say. If they already understand it, then I move on. And for those of you who have come sowing with me, you've seen. If they admit they're a sinner, they say, oh yeah, I'm orthodox or whatever, then they already know, hey, a lot of these things already. So I'm moving on. Because up to point one, two, and three, this is generally stuff that people already know. It's not until point four and five where you start really getting into the differences of what most people already know. But sometimes when you're talking to, like, say, a Chinese international student, there are, there are people where you say, have you heard of it? No. You know, you know what he did? No. Have you ever seen like a Christmas thing? No, nothing. It's like, whoa. So this is where you might have to spend some time with him and explain in a bit more depth, you know, what Jesus is, who he is. Um, now one thing you want to emphasize at this point is that Jesus Christ was not just a man that died for our sins. You know, a lot of people think, you know, Jesus Christ was this historical figure, a prophet, a good teacher, a moral teacher, it's a man, very influential man. So I try and emphasize here, no, no, no. Jesus Christ was actually God, manifest in the flesh. And if they want to pray, I might show them this passage, right? First Timothy 3. I might show them John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So I want them to understand that God didn't just send some other person, right, to go and die for you. He actually came in the flesh, put on flesh, and died for your sins. Right? He actually came for you. Now, one of the passages I like to show as well, sometimes when you're talking to a Muslim, a Muslim will say, you know, they, they get it from Zakir Naik, which was this, uh, this Muslim preacher, and they'll say, oh, you know, they'll say, show me in the Bible anywhere where Jesus says, I am God, worship me, and then I'll convert to Christianity, which is a complete, like, you know, hypocritical way they throw an argument, because it, it, because why is it? Because they're, they're saying, if you show me something in the Bible, I'll believe it. But then you show them that Jesus is the Son of God multiple times in the Bible. They don't believe that. So obviously it's just some objection they bring up. That they're not even taking the Bible seriously. They're just trying to trip you up with it. But this is the passage I sometimes show them when uh, I say, okay, well, Jesus didn't say those exact words. But look, this is where somebody calls him, my Lord and my God, and he receives that praise. 
And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. So this is the second time Jesus is coming to the disciples gathered in that room. Thomas wasn't there the first time. Now he's here the second time. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger. Behold my hands. Why? Because he can actually see the spear. He can see the, and feel the nails in his hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and, and said unto him, He's talking to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So did Jesus correct him? He's saying, hey, no, I'm not God, I'm just a guy. No, no, he received that. I, I heard some people try and get around this by saying, he's saying to Jesus, my Lord and my God. <laughs> That's like saying to two different people. It's like he wasn't actually calling Jesus God. She's saying, my Lord to Jesus and my God to God. But, you know, that's, I don't know how you get around this. I mean, this is Thomas calling, you know, it's like when Stephen, you know, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. There's a different ways where they actually address Jesus as God. So, you know, in this one, this is very familiar to us because we all know about Jesus. But, you know, I want to make sure that they know about the virgin birth, you know, that Jesus was sinless. There's certain things I want to hit on, right? Virgin birth, that he was sinless, that he was God, right? That's why he's able to die for our sins, his deity. And obviously his death, his burial. And I usually mention the fact that he descended into hell as well. You know, his soul descended into hell three days and three nights, and three days later he rose again. Now, why, why do I mention the hell in that? One, I believe it was necessary for us to be saved, right? Because he took that full punishment for us. But also to me, for, for most logically thinking people, people will think, like, how does a man dying in, in one moment? But, but my punishment was an eternity of hell, right? Like, so where was that hell payment? So I mentioned it to them, so it's like, hey, see how this, this is how he was able to take away. If our punishment was hell, point two, Jesus took that away because in three days and three nights, his soul actually descended into the heart of the earth, like Jonah in the, in the whale's belly. But because he's God, he's able to pay for an eternity of hell for us in three days and three nights. And then, obviously, the resurrection, that he bodily rose again from the dead and um, he's now in heaven waiting for us. So these are some, just some things I'll mention just to explain, hey, this is who Jesus is, this is what he did, this is why he's able to do it, and this is what he did in order to take our punishment away from us. Now the fourth point, and this is, this is four and five is where I spend a bit more time because this is where most people do not understand uh, the differences, right? Where, where the difference is between what you have to do to be saved. Now, what I'll say to them at this point, I'll say, think about this. We both deserve hell. I'm talking about the person and I. We both deserve hell and we're both unable to be perfect, right? To work our way to heaven. But Jesus died, and I explained in the last one, he's died for everyone's sins, past, present, and future. Right? So the question is, if Jesus has died for everyone's sins, but some people still go to hell, right? Some people are still thrown into the lake of fire, then the question is, what, I say, what's the difference between you and me? You know, so that's why I say, like, you know, if, you, if you're not saved, but I am saved, but we both deserve hell, we both can't be good enough, what's the difference? Jesus died for both of us, so what's the difference? Why, why can I say I'm going to heaven and you're not sure that you're going to heaven? So this is when I'll go to Acts 16. See, this is what we're talking about. The question was asked, point blank, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I'll say, hey, this is what we were, we're talking about. We're talking about, hey, how to be saved. Well, here's the answer. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And when I'm showing them these verses, I'm showing it to them. You know, don't get into the habit of you know, I think it's a better habit when you read a verse to them, you show them the Bible, get them to read it as well as you say it, rather than you just hold your Bible and just talk to them. It's just easier for them to follow. And this is why I highlight my Bible. You don't have Bible highlighters? Let me know. I'll give you some. And highlight my Bible. When I show it to them, they're not scanning like, oh, where is he talking? It's just yellow. It's boom. It's right there, right? And they're reading it. They know exactly what I'm reading, and I'll show it to them. Right? It's because I should have these memorized. 
So I can just show it to them. Because sometimes you can't see. Like, I sometimes just show it to them. See the yellow highlight? And I just read it to them. But then, then they can read the paper and I'm saying it to them. Now at this point, I'll ask them. So like I said, you're asking questions on the way, but I'll ask them, hey, what does this verse say you have to do to be saved? Because sometimes when you read a verse to somebody, they'll say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you, then you say, then you say, so what does this verse say you have to do to be saved? Uh, be a good person, you know? <laughs> so it's like, it just shows that they weren't listening. So you want to like ask along the way to make sure that they're listening to what you're saying. So when they say, oh yeah, it's just believe. And I'll say, does it say anything else? No, it's just, it's only belief. Right? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that thou shalt be saved. Does it say you have to do anything else? No. But then I might say to them, but how many times have you heard people say, hey, you've got to be baptized to be saved? You've got to do good works to be saved. You've got to go to church to be saved. You've got to try and do good works. But what does the Bible say? So I'll contrast that to things they might have heard. But the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's a tip. And, and this is like especially for people that already have like a Christian background, but you know they're not saved based on their answers, right? Because they said, oh, I'm a pretty good person, all that sort of stuff. Now, this is what I mentioned at this point. So when they read that, I say to them, you know what, you read this and you're probably thinking, you know what, well, I already believe in Jesus Christ. And like 99 times out of 100, like that's been what they're thinking. So then I've just like worked it into how I explain things. Because I say, look, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for somebody with a Christian background. And I say, you know, you read that, you're probably thinking, I already believe in Jesus Christ. Does that mean I'm okay? And then they'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, I, was, I was thinking that. So then I say, how I have to explain to you what does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? So just try and focus as I explain Because this point I'm about to explain to you, I found it's been very effective in helping people to grasp what it actually means to put their faith on Jesus Christ. So I'll say, you know what? Remember when I asked you, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? What was your first answer? I hope I'm good enough. So I say, you see how your first answer was you're looking to yourself in order to get yourself to heaven. So you see how you're actually believing on you to take you to heaven. But I say, when the Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't just mean you know what he's done. Because before we had this conversation, you already knew what he had done. Right? That's why when we breeze through point one, two, and three, generally they already know. But I'll say, but look, you see how you haven't yet believed on Jesus Christ. You're still looking to yourself to get yourself to heaven. And that's why you need to put your faith on Jesus. Now, just what I explained to you there, obviously I'm not expecting you guys to just remember everything in this sermon today. You might need to listen to this again and obviously take some practice. But when I get to this point and I explain that, so, like countless times, the light has come on, right? It doesn't necessarily mean they get saved, but it's just understanding the distinction between just knowing about Jesus and thinking that they're believing in him and what I mean by and what the Bible means by believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, which means you actually are trusting the death, burial, and resurrection to take you to heaven as opposed to your own good works. So it's at this point that I mention that. And just that sequence of events, I read, hey, what does the Bible say? Believe, does it say anything else? No? Hey, you're reading this, you're probably thinking, I already believe in Jesus Christ. Well, let me explain to you what believe means. Remember you said, and I insert whatever they said, you see how that's looking to this, or it's something else? But the Bible says, hey, you gotta, that's, your faith has to be on what Jesus has done. Now, so I found, I found that to be a very effective way of explaining it at this point, right? Point number four. So, one is, I want them to understand it's only belief. It's not by works. Another thing I want them to understand at this point is I want them to understand what it means to believe. Right? Believe doesn't mean I'm willing to follow Jesus. Believe doesn't mean I'm committed to going to church. and you know, Believe doesn't mean I'm willing to stop sinning. And, you know, believe means I'm trusting the death, burial, and resurrection, the work that Jesus has already done, that's what's getting me to heaven, not the work I do or I'm going to do. Right? So that's what I want them to understand that point. And then another thing I want them to understand is that it's only faith. It's not works. Right? So that's, that's one thing I want them to understand. And one other thing I want them to understand at this point as well is I want them to realize 
that if they were to die now, they would be in hell. This is where I'm trying to get them, what am I trying to do here? So remember, I was trying to get them to admit they were a sinner, but sometimes even people that think they're a sinner still don't think they're worthy of going to hell. They don't realise that they will end up in hell. So another thing I want them to understand at this point is, is if you don't believe on Jesus Christ, you end up in hell. So a way that I try and get them to admit that is say, look, do you see how you have not believed on Jesus Christ? No? So do you see how, like, where would you go if you were to die right now? They say, well, I would, I would go to hell. You know, or they, st they still think, well, I would still go to heaven. No, I need to re-explain that. I need to find out what's not connecting the dots, right? But if I can get them to admit that, that's one thing that helps, right? Especially when you try and explain to them, hey, what to do to be saved. It's like you have to, you have to explain to somebody that they're not saved first. So that's why you explain that they're a sinner, you explain that they deserve hell, you need to get them to admit that you are actually not saved right now. If you were to die, you would go to hell. And then they will be more receptive to understand, hey, what do I have to do to be saved? Now another thing is, I might explain to them, hey, why is it only believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? And I'll use this analogy of a gift, Ephesians 2, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast so i'll use this analogy of a gift right and well let me just get uh get something just like show you because what i usually do is i usually do a bit of an object lesson to, to get them to understand this and the good thing about this microphone is like oh i can be in here and you guys should be able to still hear what i'm saying sorry So I'll explain it's, it's, it's like a gift, so therefore you don't pay for it, right? This is why you don't work for it. I might use an analogy of, hey, if I gave you a gift, then, you know, if I, if I, you know, I might say, hey, here's my phone. If I was to give you this phone and I was only asked for a dollar, that would be cheap, but it wouldn't be a gift. Because some people think, well, if I just do a little bit, then therefore, you know, I get it. But, hey, it's a gift, so we explain, hey, if it's a gift, even if you were to pay very little for it, it's still not a gift, right? So it doesn't require any works at all. Now here is where I try, I, I like to try and give them a visual as well. So when I'm explaining the gospel and I say, hey, salvation is not by works, it's, it's by grace. Sometimes I'll use a bit of a, object lesson to get them to understand what I'm going. So I'll be holding my Bible and I'm holding a stack of tracts. And I'll say, hey, you know what? There are actually two ways to go to heaven. Right? One way is that you're perfect. Right? And, that's, that's, and that's impossible. And this is why there's only one way left. And the other way is we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll say to them, you know, look, some people, they do this. I'll say, this is a gift. So you don't have to do any of this to get this. Do you know what some people do? Some people think, well, Jesus did his part. And I say, I'll, I'll use these. No, I'll do my part. No, I said, that, that's not going to work. You know, because it has to be a gift. It has to be completely free. God's not going to let you pay for this gift. But sometimes at this, past, at this place, when I'm explaining the gift, I'll say, this is why you can't mix the two. You can't mix works and grace. Romans 11:6. 6. If by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. So if I've got grace and I've got works here and I do this, this is not grace anymore. This is why. This is why if I give them that visual, right, this helps when I'm explaining the gospel. Sometimes that helps me to explain, hey, look, this is what people do. And it will help in the next point as well. Look at what it says in Galatians 5. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, look at this, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So I might say to them, look, see if you think you have to do one of these, that's the way you're trying to get to heaven and you have to do it all. You're a debtor to do the whole law. So it's either this or this way. You can't have a mix of the two. Now let's touch on the last point. So the point four, that was probably the most in-depth one, where I want them to understand, hey, 
You know, we only have to believe what it means to believe. We want them to understand, hey, the difference between believe and trusting yourself, trusting Jesus. I want to tie it back to their original answer. And we want them to admit, hey, if you were to die now, you would go to hell. See, if somebody, if I, if somebody won't admit that if they were to die now, they would end up in hell, I, I sort of make sure of that before I continue. Because, you know, and, and they may already be saved as well. It could be that they would just be confused. And at that point, they go, oh, yeah. Oh, like, yeah, I, I, I just spoke wrong and, you know, that sort of thing. So it helps to clear those things up. And then I use an object lesson to make them understand that it's either grace or it's either works. You can't mix the two. Now, the last point is, once you are saved, you are always saved. So, now, like I said in last week's sermon, I don't think eternal security is a different point when it comes to salvation. Salvation by grace automatically equates to once you're saved, you're always saved. Because you didn't earn salvation, you're not going to be bad enough to lose it. So, point five is just a way that we re-emphasize Point four, if you think about it, it's just another way to make sure they understand it's all Jesus, it's not them. Now the verse I use to explain this is I, I found, I just ended up on John 3.16. Right? Rather than go to other passages that talk about eternal life. So this ties the last point in with the next point. So I go to John 3.16, most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So I break this verse down for them. For God so loved the world, that's us. That he gave his only begotten Son, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That whosoever believeth in him, so that's thee, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I might say to them, look, you've, you've heard this verse, if they're a Christian, or in Christian background, hey, you've heard this verse before, you know it, but look, it says exactly what I'm explaining to you. You know, whosoever believeth in him, it's not whosoever is good enough, not whosoever is baptized, whosoever you know, lives a good life or turns away from all their sins. It's whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's just faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll break it down or refer back to Acts. Now, what I want to emphasize in this last point, once you're saved, you're always saved. It's how everlasting life works. So I might ask them, hey, do you know what the word everlasting means? These are some questions you can ask. What does the word everlasting mean? So if the gift of God is everlasting, how many times do you need to get it? Oh, the everlasting life is forever. How many times do you need to get it? Just one time. What's another question I might ask? I'll say, if it lasts forever, can you ever lose it? No. I might ask them, hey, why is it forever? Why is it forever? Why once I'm saved, I'm saved forever? So I might touch again on, hey, you know, when Jesus, remember when Jesus died on the cross? He died for all your sins, past, present, and future. In fact, all our sins were in the future. So you see how there's no sin that you can commit in the future that hasn't already been paid for. So these are some of the things I'll address in this last point. Now, I might back that up if I need to re-emphasize this, and they're not getting it. John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life, they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. 1 John 5.13 is another one I might go to. Remember, we saw that in the beginning. You know you have eternal life. You know you have it now. It's eternal. Eternal is the same as everlasting. These are the sort of things I'll explain again. Now, once I've explained that once you're saved, you're always saved, I like to give a hypothetical example. So the hypothetical example is there just to tie it all together. So I'll say, hey, look, let me give you an example just to make sure you understand what I just explained to you. So I might use the first person, you know, a third person, or I might say it in the second person. I might say, hey, if you were to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today, or I might say, hey, well, let's say somebody believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. They admit they're a sinner. They know they deserve hell. They call upon the Lord, and now they're saved. And I'll say, well, how long are they saved? So this is when I start quizzing them. So how long are they saved for? Forever. Right? So it's like... I say, well, then I'll say, well, what if they don't go to church? What if they hang around with the wrong people and they commit a sin? Let's say they steal something. When they die, will they still go to heaven? Now, if they've, if they've understood it, they'll say, yeah, well, he'll still go to heaven because what you explain, he's got eternal life. Jesus paid for it. I'll say, well, is it the right thing for him to do, to, to steal? 
No, of course not. So I make it clear at this point, I'm trying to give a hypothetical to emphasize eternal life, but I'm also trying to explain, hey, I'm not condoning misbehavior. We're not saying just because you'll still go to heaven, you'll still be good. And I sort of touched on that the last couple of weeks. Right, so, but I'll, I'll mention that. Look, I'm not saying lying and stealing is okay, but if you understand how you would still go to heaven. So if they say, oh, he would still go to hell, he would need to do this first, I need to do that first, then I need to retrace my ground. Now, when you're giving a hypothetical, this hypothetical situation to see if they understand, don't make it too extreme, right? And don't make it too extreme first up. So what I tend to do now is I'll say, I might say he stole something or he told a lie, well, he still go to heaven. And then I'll say, well, let's kick it up a notch. Let's say, let's say he committed murder. You know, is that that? But then I've already sort of prepped him for the, with the first one that's a bit milder and sort of build it up. So I, what I don't think you should do is go, you know, look, well, let's say somebody gets saved, they're saved forever, right? Okay, let's say they go out and they murder like 100 people and then they rape like 50 women and then they, kill, you know, they molest like 100 children. They still going to have... Because, you know, chances are God's probably not going to let his child get to that point. I mean, hypothetically, if, if they're asking it where it's like a hypothetical... It's like, yeah, okay, hypothetically, if that situation were to exist, yes, that person would go to heaven. Right? Because Jesus has paid for all those sins. So if he receives the Lord Jesus Christ, that person will have their sins forgiven. Now, does that actually happen in real life? I doubt it. For a believer to get to that level of depravity, God will probably not allow, right? Because he's a, he's a child of God and the chastisement of God will come on him probably before he's even allowed to get to that point. So the tip is, when you give this hypothetical, to tie it all together, start a bit milder, say, hey, what if they told a lie? Still got heaven? Yeah, so you understand? It's all, all grace. And then say, hey, what if they did this? What if they commit murder? What if they commit suicide? What if they do things? And just say things that are, you know, that, that, that are in the Bible, like think, things that people have actually done, not these like, extreme examples, because then it might just get people tied up on the doctrine of eternal security as opposed to just understanding that concept, right? Because hypothetically, yes, it... it it, it does work that way, but in, practic in reality, will it ever happen like that? Uh, I highly doubt it. Now again, object lesson. Right? So I'm holding, because I'm already holding this, but I'm not soul winning, so you can use anything you want. So this is where I try and explain to them, look, if this represents salvation, and this represents my works, I, I'll say like, so look, most, I'll say most people are trying to get this with this. And they'll, they'll, if they understand what I'm saying to them, they'll understand, look, that doesn't work. And I'll say, look, so you, this get, is got without this. So I'll say, look, if somebody has this and they don't have this, are they still saved? So this is how I'm helping them to understand grace and works, grace is separating them. Yes, they're still saved. But I'll say, look, so you don't want this because that, that's they're not saved. You want this, right? They are saved. I'll say, what's, what's the ideal scenario? The ideal, what does God want? God wants both. But you need to understand that even if I don't have this, am I still saved? Yes, I'm still saved. All right, so when I give them that visual, like I said, in the last point I explained to you, when I say, hey, what does believe mean? And that clicks in their mind, that's helped me a lot. And starting to do this with the visuals, I feel like that's helped me a lot as well, to just like help it to click. Well, I'm not saying, like, look, they have works, and it's, we're all just in the mind. I'll say, like, hey, look, this represents salvation, this represents works. You can't have this, you know, it's got to all be on Jesus. Hey, even if I did had a terrible life and I didn't do anything for God, would I still be saved? Yes, because this is everlasting life. This is by grace, works is how I'm rewarded. So that's what I'm trying to explain to them. And then once they understand that, then you can get into the questions and see if they actually want to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the last thing I'll mention on this last point is sometimes if they just don't get this, that's when I'll use the illustration of being born again and say, look, the analogy of salvation is being born into God's family. You use that analogy to show, hey, look, once you're born into a family, that relationship is settled, right? Your, your parents are always your parents. Even if you're a disobedient child, even if you go out and murder somebody, that's a terrible thing. Government should punish you. God will probably chastise you, but you're still saved. But you are being a disobedient child of God. Just like you can disobey your parents, but they're still your parents because you are born into the family. So not only this passage in John 3, 
Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. John 1, 12 as well might use, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Some people have the misconception that everyone's a child of God. Wrong. Not everyone is a child of God. We actually, born, when we're sinners, we are enemies of God. Right? So you become the son of God when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we are sons of Adam. Right? So we die spiritually, and then we are born again. Right? Once we are a child of God spiritually, that cannot change. And that's a, good, that's a great analogy, even more, even more so than marriage. So I think marriage can picture salvation as well. But I think it's a lot easier for people to grasp because so many marriages end. You know, they just think like, yeah, you walk away from the marriage, just get a divorce, the marriage is over. So they just think like, it doesn't really explain your point well. So I feel like the, the, what the, the analogy Jesus used when he was talking to Nicodemus works a lot better. And people understand, yeah, no matter what they do, their parents are always their parents, no matter what. All right, I know that was a lot of tips and I know I do a tip sermon like this every now and then. It's, it's because... A lot of you don't go soul winning with me. So I'm trying to give you my thought processes as I go through each point. What am I trying to address? How I'm trying to do it? Now, obviously, you're not going to remember everything from this sermon. Right? But if you don't do anything about it, you're going to forget it all. Right? James 1, my last passage I want to go to. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Why are you deceived when you're a hearer of the word and not a doer? Because the people who hear the word and don't do anything about it, they think they're spiritual. Right? They think they're growing. They think they're mature. They think like, well, you know, I'm listening to a lot of preaching. Right? I'm learning a lot. You're deceiving your own selves because you think you're more spiritual than you are. Right? If you're not a doer of the work, doing is is where we want to strive to. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, looking into a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, he's looking at himself, and goeth his way, and straightway, so immediately, forgetteth what manner of man he was. See, this is the problem. I preached this to you this morning. If you don't take it in and go, you know what, hey, you might take one or two things from this sermon and go, hey, next time I talk to somebody about the gospel, and hopefully that sometime soon. You'll use it, you're going to remember it. If you don't, you're like somebody that looks at themselves in the mirror, you walk away and you straightway forget what you look like. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, it's the Bible, and continueth therein. So you see how you're not only hearing it, looking into the perfect law of liberty, you continue therein, you're doing it. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in the deeds. Think, think about the sermons that you remember the most. It's something where you took on something and you say, hey, whoa, I'm going to use something. You remember that one. You remember those things. So the things that you do are the things that you remember. So you might be thinking this morning, Victor, oh man, this is just so much to remember. Like how am I going to do it? Look, I did not get to this point in one day, one week. I mean, I've been soul winning since like 2005, right? So many, many years of trial and error and messing and you know what i don't expect you to remember all these things hopefully you just pick up one thing here and there put it into practice and you know when you first start going soul winning you start off as, as a silent partner you start off listening and learning and you know what when you start trying you are going to fail you know you are going to choke you know you are going to embarrass yourself you're going to say the wrong things you might give the wrong answer you're going to you know, but, you, but you've got to try. You know, if you don't try, you, you never get better. And that's why you may look at somebody like me and go, oh, you know, Victor just easily explains it. Like, you just know, yeah, but this is like years and years of me making a fool of myself and trying and saying this and that. And go, you know, they say something, and they go, oh, I get the answer to that one. Next time, I'm not going to get caught, right? So this is how this works. And you have to try because you know what? You may be the difference between somebody going to heaven and somebody going to hell. And as long as you don't quit, you know, you'll keep growing. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the promise of salvation. And I pray, Lord, that this sermon will help people, even if they listen to it later, get these points. A few tips 
on how to explain the plan of salvation. Lord, help us, even myself, Lord, to help us to constantly be improving how we can explain this to people, different ways we can address things or picture things or just uh, illustrate things. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to be faithful in the work. Help us, Lord, I pray that you'll send forth laborers into your harvest. And also, Lord, pray that you'll give us the wisdom to know what to say to each person because they're all so different. Um, so we thank you, Lord, for your blood in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.